This week we're going to be talking a little bit about God's love is ex external and eternal. God's love is external and eternal. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about God's love for us. Do you know that when we represent and we realize this, that God loves you. God loves you and that God cares for you. Now, just a couple things before I get into this. Laura is doing the translating back there. Um, I, I've, I've threatened her. I told her, I said, Laura, I want you on the stage with me so you can preach with me. And she said, Pastor, I don't want to be up front. Uh, but I, I, I love it if she could get up here with me and preach with me. But uh, I appreciate her doing that. If you need a headset for the translating, it's in the back back there. And uh, you can, she's going to be translating everything I say, she says in, in Spanish. And so we can do that. Somebody said, well, Pastor, uh, we really don't want a translator on the stage with you. And he here's what I'm going to tell you is this. If you have ever worn those headsets during a service and you've heard it translated, you know what I'm saying. That's hard to do. And I appreciate the effort that we put into it to do that ministry. But it's hard. And so we've, we've done this, and, and God is progressing our ministry, and I'm hoping and praying that we can do some, some things to advance in our ministry of what we're doing. And God is good. That song that says it all, God is good. Amen. I just wanted to touch base with you on that. But last week we talked about defining God's love, and we talked about the fact that God loves us. Now I want you to do this for me, and I, I want you to look at about two or three people, just look them right in the eyes. Now I know you got to do it on the right and the left. So I want to see some of you look at somebody and just tell them God even loves you. Just look at them right in the eye. I want you to look at your brother. God even loves you. He does. Amen. God loves you. I wanted you, you two brothers look at each other and say God even loves you. No, they're not going to do that. There's no way, Pastor. Uh, sometimes when we, when we come to, to, to realize this, God loves us. In spite of our faults and our flaws, in, Sparta, in spite of everything. And, it, you know, God even loved us. That we talked last week. God even loved us while we were yet sinners. And he loved us so much that he didn't want to leave us in sin because God knows that sin separates us from his love. And sin is, is something that, that, that as we, we walk in this world, sin will separate us from the love that God has for us. And, and, and God loves us so much. Now, God didn't save us so that we could stay in sin. He separated us so that we could be changed and transformed from that sin. And so as we look at this and we begin to think about the love of God and what God is, I wanted to preach this morning in this, ser this series about the God uh, of, of his love, that his love is external and his love is eternal. And what does that mean to us? So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the gospel of, in 1 John, back at the back of your Bibles, if you will, go with me. We have it up on the screen. Now, you did, I'm sure most of you brought your Bibles. Just hold them up like this, if you brought your Bible. For those of you who have it on your phone, that's okay. Uh, just the person that's sitting beside you, if you see them switch over to Facebook, turn their phone off. Amen. Amen. But here's what I'm going to tell you. Whatever you do, and, and I'm sure that, that, that what you need to do is understand, it's going to be on the screen, and I want you to stay with me on the screen, but you need to read it and see it, and you need to open it so you can understand it. And, and as we go through this, I pray that you will not take what I read or say for granted. I want you to read it, and I want you to understand God's love for us. Love is the, the, the pivotal point to where we are and who we are in, in our relationship with God. I told you last week the defining point and definition of what love is. Love is God. God is love. Whether you believe it or not, God is love. And the define, definition of love truly is what we find in the Bible. And the definition of what love is and what love's got to do with it is basically everything in our relationship with Him. But in 1 John, the fourth chapter, starting in the ninth verse, we realize this, it says, In this is love. In this the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Verse 10 says this, In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. 
Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. But if we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. Now this week we're going to talk a little bit about God's love, the external internal relationship of God. God has loved us and loved mankind forever. And I know that a lot of times we get caught up in the situation of the Old Testament and we'll think, well, what about the wrath of God? Do you know that the wrath of God was poured out because of the instruction? And there's coming a day when God's vengeance against sin, God's vengeance against sin, God hates sin, but He loves the sinner. If God didn't love the sinner, we would not be saved today. But God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son so that we would not dwell in our sin but be transformed through the blood of Jesus Christ who became the willing and worthy sacrifice to transform us and change us. This morning as we realize the internalness of God and that God's love is eternal, I want us to look at what it says in, first, in the Gospel of John. Now go back to the Gospels of John. And, and this is, I usually say that there's 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and generic John. This is generic John without any numbers in front of it. So the Gospel of John says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him. And without Him nothing was made that was made. And in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. That simple scripture there just begins to tell us about the idea. Jesus Christ is eternal. He is God. Amen? If God is love, then Jesus is love. That's what kept him on the cross. You see, the Bible says that he could have called 10,000 angels to come and put, take, him, take over. Just Even at one time, God was so sick of the sin and the rebellion of man. The Bible says in the book, of, when, he was, when, he, when we read about the, the, the story of Noah, how that God had, had become so sickened by the sin of this world that he says, I'm just going to destroy it all. But there was one man found worthy that was Noah. And God saved mankind because of the faithfulness of Noah. Now, if you look at that and you begin to understand a little bit more about the, the idea of God and, and the sickening of sin, God hates sin. As much as He loves us, He hates sin. And there are things that you need to understand is that sin will destroy us in any fashion or any way. Play with sin. You know the old saying says, if you play with fire, you're going to get burned. You play with sin, you're going to be destroyed. Satan is the liar and the father of lies. He's the deceiver of the brethren. He is the one who comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. He comes to destroy your dreams, to steal your soul, and to kill you from the very opportunity that God has. Because see, before you were born, God had a plan for you. You realize that? That's how much God knows about you. Before you were ever born, he said, I have a plan for you. I have a purpose for you. Amen? And, and sometimes it's hard for us to fathom that because we get so far off in our, in our life. We get so far away from the direction and the plan that God has for us that we lose track of the fact that God has a perfect plan for us. Sometimes we want to do it the Burger King way and we want it our way. And we try to convince God that it's supposed to be our way, but God will humble our hearts to bring us back to where we need to be with Him. Amen? When God crumbles our, our dreams, sometimes it's the fact that He needs to do that so that we can progress forward in Him. As we look at this section of Scripture, we, we, we realize this last verse there, and it says, And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. What a tragedy when Jesus came to this earth. Because I've heard people say this a lot. If I could see Jesus, I would believe. Jesus walked the earth, did miracles in front of mankind, walked and did the things and signs and wonders that no one could explain, turned water into wine, healed the blinded eyes, made the lame to walk, and yet they denied who He was and refused to accept Him. They even came to the place to where they accused Him of being a criminal and they crucified Him. So don't tell me if you saw Him, you would follow Him. Because I can tell you this, 
I would rather feel Him in my heart and know Him as He moved through this place this morning. When we were worshiping Him and began to feel His presence, I'm going to tell you something, I want that. Because the, 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 the presence and the power of God that, that gives us hope and gives us a dream is the fact that we must realize that He is with us. God's love is eternal. It didn't begin uh, from the, the time that we sinned. It didn't begin when we, we began to when we were born. God's love has been with us throughout time. God's love always has been. And the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The convincing part of that is, is Jesus Christ has loved us from creation. Amen. God loves us. The next thing we realize is God's love is eternal. In Genesis, the Bible tells us that God had a solution for sin before sin ever came. God had a resolution. Then, then why did God let sin happen? Why did, why did God let Adam and Eve sin? Because He loved us so much. Listen, if I have to love you, then I really don't love you. I heard a preacher say this one time and it, it just irritated my spirit. He said, I have to love you, and if I don't love you, I can't go to heaven, so I have to love you. And you know what? Here's the problem with us saying that. You don't have to love. But if you don't love, then the hatred of the heart begins to become bitter and angry. God loved us. And that when we come to the nature of realizing that God loved us, He loved us and He gave to us and He brought to us the very works. And in the, in the book of Genesis, the Bible says that He had a resolution for sin. Before the sin was ever committed, He already had an answer to it. Because He knew mankind. He knew His creation. But God gives us the opportunity. Do you know everything else in creation and everything else that God has created? does what it's supposed to, but he gave us a choice. A tree is a tree, a dog is a dog. Come on. But he gives mankind a choice because we have the choice to love him or not. I did this a few years ago, but when I was younger, and I know some of you probably were more mature than this, but when I was in elementary school, I had a girl that I had a crush on. Anybody ever been there before? And I, I was trying to look at her, and I thought, well, I'm going, to, I'm going to let her know that I like her, but I don't want her to know that it's me. So I sent her a little note, and I said, if you love me, check yes or no. <laughs> and I slipped it on her desk while she was gone. And Denny, I came back, and, just to, and, and I thought, man, oh, man, oh, man. When she turns around and she realizes, you know, I'm going to tell you something. If you ask somebody that, they're going to respond. And I saw the mark on it, and she marked the part that said yes. And I was sitting two seats back, but I could see her. And I saw her mark yes. And I was so excited because she said yes. But because I didn't have my name on it, she turned around to my friend and said, thank you, I love you too. Sometimes you got to be careful where you direct your love. You know, you, this morning you may be here and you may, you may love something. Come on. You may, how many of you love chocolate? Good. The rest of you are liars. Anyways, <laughs> go ahead. So, so how many, we, we've already discussed how many of us love. We love chicken. We love watermelon. I, come on. Watermelon's my favorite. I love watermelon. Just a big a slice of watermelon. <sighs> For those of you who put salt on watermelon, you're ruining it. Chuck, you're in trouble. You're ruining it. So uh, we can think of all the things. How many of you? How many of you have, like the Diamondbacks? <laughs> Baseball season's coming up. Come on, man. We gotta have more fans. How many of you like them stinking Dallas Cowboys? <laughs> so we got, uh, some of us are sporting fans, and, and some of us are, are, are we we love our teams and we 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 cheer for them. Come on, my my son Joey calls them bandwagon fans. Where, you, where you'll support the team because it's winning. If you're really a diehard, I've been a Cubs fan since I lived in northern Indiana and I have moved all over the country. And I am going to tell you something, there for a few years there was nothing to cheer about with the Cubs. But I stayed loyal to them. Thank you, Jamie. 
So I stayed loyal to them and I stayed faithful to them. And finally, when they came with the winning season and they won the World Series, I thought, man, now that we have done this, but I can still tell you that I'm a, a Chicago Cubs fan. And I, and, I, and I look at that and I think, I love my Cubs. But I can tell you this, those things that I say I love cannot compare to the love that I have for God. And sometimes when we mistake our love and we begin to describe our love, we miss our love because love misplaced is for love of the things of this world instead of the love of God. Oftentimes we look at this and we begin to think about God's love being eternal. God's love for us lasts forever. God's love has always been for mankind. God's love for us was one who stood the test and stood the test of time. The Bible says in the fullness of time God sent forth His Son to be the propitiation for our sin. God measured the time frame. Man went through years and years in the wilderness, through Egypt and through then from Egypt they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years to try to find the answer and the resolution. There were many that, that were uh, caught up in saying, God will never send the Messiah. And then Jesus came. And they still begin to doubt whether the Messiah was ever going to come. Come on. God's love for us as it's transitioned over the years, God's love for us has progressed. God's love for us never changed. God's love for us in that Garden of Eden when God uh, found Adam and Eve that had sinned, God's love for them had not changed. God was angry. Come on. God was disappointed. God was disappointed with Adam and said, what have you done? Adam and Eve were told not to eat of the fruit of the tree uh, of good and evil, but they, they did it because the Bible says they were caught up in their own lust. They were caught up in their own desire. And the serpent had convinced them that it was okay. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes Satan will convince us that sin is okay. And we'll go on living that life convinced that sin is okay, but God hates sin. And God will, will do everything He can. And when we go down this path of sin, we separate ourselves from God. And the longer that we... Ha Listen, Adam and Eve, the first thing they did after they sinned and after they disobeyed God was they went and hid. Now, how many of you realize that God is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent? He's everywhere at all times. He is terrible to play hide-and-seek with. I never will forget one time my granddaughter... Paisley, when she was real little, she said, Papa, let, let's play hide-and-seek. And I said, okay. That's, that's Brittany's kid. Can you believe Brittany's got a kid now? But Brit Paisley said, Papa, let's go play hide-and-seek. So Paisley went in there, and, and we have a... She went in, and so she opened the door, and she closed it, and she was in the shower. And I walked upstairs, and I... I mean, we, we have a plastic, clear plastic front on the shower. And she's in there and she says, like this, like she's hiding, like I can't see her because she closed the door. That's kind of like playing hide and seek with God, you know? It's kind of like trying to hide your sins from God. God knows what you do before you do it. God knows your thoughts before you think them. God knows our sinful nature. The fact is, that's why he sent his son. To know us and to redeem us from our sins. And if, we're, if we realize this, then the blood of Jesus Christ is enough to change us and transform us. That's how much God loves you. That's how much His eternal love for you is. Is no matter what place you are or no matter where you are, no matter the struggles that you have in your life, God sent His Son to be the stead of our sins. So this morning, right now, hear me today, because I feel like God's speaking to some hearts. You've been struggling because you've been living with this sin in your life and you think that God can't love you enough, but God loves you. I'm going to speak this and, and hear this. And, and, and you need to hear this. This is from God. You are beautifully and wonderfully made. You are made in the image of God. And God has a divine work. Now, I'm glad that we're different in the way that we're made, but you are made according to God's plan. Don't the, let the enemy lie to you about trying to convince you that you've got to change yourself. 
to be something else. God loves you just the way you are. God loved me when I was short. And he still loves me because I'm short. God loved me when I had hair. God loves me when I don't have hair. Amen. God loved me when I was young and in trouble. God loved me through my teen years. God loved me in my mischievous stage. God loves me today. Even sometimes when I, when I make the silly decisions, God still loves me. You know what? God loves me. That song comes to my mind. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Listen, you need to understand this. No one is so far gone that God doesn't love you. God just wants to bring you back to where he can fulfill his plan and his purpose for you so he can bring you to the place to where you need to be. And that's what God's love is for us today. God's love is eternal. Secondly, we realize that God's love is external. You see, not only is God's love represented by his eternal love for us, but it's also got to be demonstrated by us who love him. God's love is demonstrated through the works that we do. In, John, in 1 John, the fourth chapter, and verse 10, it says, For in this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, now listen to this, we ought to love one another. You see, the love of, uh, of God is not, and, and, and part of the vision statement for our church is about us loving God and God loving us, but it's also about us reaching out to love others. Amen? Amen. It's also about us learning to love. That's why we do the work that we do downtown. That's why we do the ministry months. That's why we do the outreaches and the services is because we want to extend God's love beyond our capabilities and capacity. It's the, the thing that we're going to learn through the month of March is this. It's not about me. Come on. Some of us are serving God about myself. Me, me, me. I mean, if we could, if, if just think of this, instead of the iPhone, they would have called it the me phone. Come on. And some of us love ourselves so much that we take these, what they call these, everybody know what I'm going to say? Selfies. How many of you have ever taken a selfie? And you've been so proud of it after you do all the makeup and everything, and you what, you do that. What do you call that correction on it? How you you do that where you change how good you look and you make you look better. When I tried to load that on my phone, it said not acceptable on this phone because of the pictures and content. No, I'm just kidding. But they they'll take that phone and they'll they'll look at that and they call it an iPhone. It, it might as well be called a me phone. And then a selfie might as well be called I love myself. Because if you're putting it out there for somebody else to look at you and say, oh, you look so good. We know that you photoshopped it. We're not going to tell you that. And if we do say something like that, it's because we want to make you feel good. But God loved us so much and God looked at us and said, I've made you in my image and I've made you perfect. Why do you want to do that? When we look at the idea of this I and me generation, this selfie, this, this self-centeredness that oftentimes comes to us, and we forget that God wants us to love others as He loved us. God just doesn't love us. He loves everyone. He loves the sinner in the street. He loves those who don't know Him. He loves those who need Him. God is love. Amen. And we need to introduce His love to a lost and dying world. And the way we do that is by reaching them and sharing the love of God. 1 John, the third chapter. If you have your Bibles, you might want to underline this, especially those who are involved in our outreach ministry. This is one of the scriptures, and I believe that this spoke to me as hard as anything. When I was downtown and we were providing food, the first time that I went there a few years ago, about four years ago now, we went downtown, and I, 
I'd been before a, con a group of people like that, but never seen it to the capacity that I saw it that first time. When I went down there, I realized that we are giving love to people who need to know God's love. First John, the third chapter, it says, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And every time that we give them food down there, just a bag with a sandwich in it. It's not an extravagant sandwich. It's got a little bit of meat on it, some cheese and mustard and mayonnaise. And we put that together, and I'm going to tell you something. We put a, we, we'll put a banana in it, and we'll give them a water bottle, and, 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 and sometimes we'll have a cookie or a snack or whatever we have, and we'll give that to them. And you give that, and you put that in someone's hands that hasn't eaten for a few weeks or a week, and they look at that and they, they, they're overwhelmed with gratitude. And every time I think about that, Al, it brings me to that scripture right there that I just read. Having done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. Having done it to the, to the nature of the need and, and to the minister to the need. And, it's, and it just floors me to the fact that here, I'm all, we're all centered about me, 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 God. I need, I need. And some of us, that's all we think about is what I need. And we never realize there's a world dying and go to hell. And what they need is us to share the love of God. They need to know the love of God. That God loves them. And part of that is demonstrating the love by giving to them. The Bible says if we have it, then we need to give it. Because if we see someone in need, listen, come on. How many of you in here right now are without any needs in your life? You know there's not one hand that went up. Some of you, I mean, we, we, we might not have everything, but every one of us have needs. You know, let me go through the list of mine. Hold on just a second. I have, you know, come on. How many, of you, when, how many of you there are people, have you ever met somebody that, that will tell you everything that's wrong with them when you meet them? And so you don't ever ask them, hey, how are you doing today? Well, let me tell you, I got this corn on my toe. Let me show you my toe here. I got, I got this bad spot. And oh, it smells so bad. Here, you want to smell it? And I got, I got this ache and I got, oh, I got this problem here when I've been and I got oh I've been constipated for three weeks and you know I, I've got all these and you go through all these problems and by the time they're done you're going oh my goodness get me out of here why did I ask you and most time by the time they're done they never remember to say how are you today because they're so centered in me come on and a lot of us come to church that same way and all we're thinking about is me I come to this church and I'm saying, oh, God, I need, I need, I need. And God's saying, I want you to be, I want you to be my hands and my feet. I want you to be my voice that speaks. I want you to go into the lost and dying world. That's why his command is to go, not to sit. And God's word tells us that we are to go and compel them to come in. Go into the highways and the hedges and compel them. The Bible says that the, the great commission is to go and teach all nations. And the word of God is so strong about this that we, we must realize the importance of it. Jesus himself taught in Matthew, the 25th chapter. He says, he gives us the illustration of this and he begins to, to speak this, if you will. And he says, the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of the father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you for the foundations of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Now listen to what he says. The righteous will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you and thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick? or in prison and come to you. 
And the king will answer and say unto you, Surely I say to you, and as much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. You see, when I, when I give him that bag, and I know, I, I, I know, sometimes they're rough looking. Sometimes they've, they've, they've had a tough time in life. They don't have an opportunity. And, and, and some of them, they're, they're ashamed of where they are because of what happened, what's happened in their life. But that don't matter. They need to know that God loves them. And I love to, to just walk up to them and give them, and, and Martin, I don't want to give them a bag of food, but I want to give them a hug. I say, God loves you. God loves you. And they'll look at me and they say, thank you. I needed to hear that. And you see, it's not about me getting anything. I, I'm, listen, I'll tell you the first thing is, is I have never found one homeless person, Bob. I've never found them when I hug them and give them a bag of food. I say, God bless you that they've slipped a 20 in my hand. Never has it, Don. Never have happened. But you know what? What God is saying, I'm going to bless you because you are my hands and my feet. You are my extension. And, 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 and I don't have to worry about that because I'm not laying up treasures on this earth. God has taken care of me. The Bible says the righteous will never be forsaken. They'll be, they will never need. Amen? We live in a spoiled generation. We have more than enough. We throw away more food. If we would... Ah, oh, do you want me to drag me down that path? We throw away so many leftovers. We could feed nations. Come on. My mom used to tell me this all the time. You better eat that. Those kids in China are starving to death. And so you see what happens. I've saved a lot of children in China by eating my own food. Thank you, Jamie. You are amen and at the right times today. But here's, here's what happens. Is that we, when, we, when we take in consideration, sometimes we can cut back to give to someone else. What really touched my heart was we were out of bags of food. We had run out. We told them there's no more food. And people were still coming. They were still coming. They were still coming. This has been a few years ago. They're still coming. We gave them the food. And one lady came up to us and she said, is there any more food? And I said, no, we don't have any more. She turned around to walk away. And there was a guy that I had given two bags of food to because he said I haven't eaten in a long time. He says, okay, if I take two. You know what he did? He walked over and he opened the bags and looked at it and he opened the other bag and he started eating one bag and he heard me say that and so he walked over and he said, here, you can have this bag. Amen. And he gave his bag. That's all he had. You know what he told me when he, when he asked for two bags? He said, I haven't eaten in, in a while. And I, I mean, I'd eat again for a while. Is it okay if I take two? And I said, sure. I mean, I'd give you a bunch of them, but and I, when I gave him that, and, and then he turned around and he gave it away. That's God's love. That's God sharing love. When you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. When you go to the prisons and you minister, God, you're, you're ministering the love of God. You're telling people that, that the world has said, we don't like you, we don't love you, you've made mistakes, you're horrible, you're awful. That's what the world tells them. The church needs to speak in volumes to say, God loves you. It's got to be external. It cannot just be internal for me and you to keep. It's got to be demonstrated in the actions that we share and we show. Go ahead and bring up the next one. John 21 says this, For when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. And then he said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, tend my sheep. Verse 17, he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know I, you know all things, and you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. 
Now, there are a lot of biblical scholars that have different reasons why he said it three times, possibly because Peter had denied him three times before. Probably that was one of the reasons. The second thing is, is that Peter was thick-headed. None of us are that way. God has to keep asking us, do you love me? Do you, do you really love me? Listen, if you know that God loves you, then share the love of God with someone. Don't share the love of, of God because someone's lovable. Mm-mm. You know what? You need, you need to share love with someone who maybe the world has said, you're not worth it. But God so loved them. God sent his son for them. And our job and our task today is to realize that Jesus said, and, and, and every time, if you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, take care of my sheep. If you love me, and he said, if you love me more than all the things that he has. Peter was looking, and one time when he asked Jesus, I believe that he was asking, and he looked out over everything that Peter had, all the fish that they had caught, everything, and all, all of that, and he said, do you love me more than these? Come on, do you love God? Come on more than the things that you have? If you lost everything, would you still say, I love Jesus? And then secondly, he said, if you love me, more than the rest of these. Come on. He was saying, listen, do you love me more than you love your friends? More than your brothers? More than those that you've had relationship with these last three and a half years? More than those that are going to preach and teach and go to their very death preaching the gospel of Christ? Do you love me more than them? And then thirdly, he says, do you love me? And he was talking to Peter at the point, and he said, do you love me more than yourself? More than these? More than this? See, I want to I tell you this, this, this way. The decision that you make to love is that you put God first in your life. That's what God requires of us. The second thing that God tells us to do is that then because we love God, we demonstrate it by loving others, by feeding his sheep, by providing for them, by tending for them, for, by caring for them. And that's why we do what we do, because God loved us that we ought to love others because God loved us. God loves us. Come on. And it's good to hear that God loves me and God loves you. Amen. But God loves them. And the only way that they may ever hear that message is if we take that message to them and share the love of God. God puts people in your life all the time. You know this. I'm not preaching anything that you don't already know. God puts people in your life that you have a hard time loving. Anybody got somebody like that? Maybe it's a relative. Could be the person standing beside you. Just kidding. Ah, he's in trouble. I saw that. It could be that God puts you in a place where you're working and, and there may be somebody that just irritates you to death. They are, ooh, just the very... You know what? They're the ones that God said they need to know that God loves them. And that's what's hard is because they need to know the love of God. And, and it may be the most difficult thing for you to take this, this, this message today, but I am telling you that God put you where you are. Stop complaining about it and start saying, God, how can you use me in this? And if you'll do that, God will begin to transform where you are. Amen. And things will change. It will change you, and it may change the environment because love is contagious.